All right, well, good morning, everyone. So glad you are here with us today. I am having a blast this Sunday. Holy smokes. It's fun to be in a place where the Holy Spirit is moving the way that he's moving right now. Um, and before we even get into uh, the sermon, there's actually a couple words that were given this morning, and I wanted to read them to you because uh, I don't want you to miss out on something that maybe God wanted to say to you. And so the first one starts with a piece of scripture um, from Isaiah 61. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel... He will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. And the word that goes along with it in breaking down the verse, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you right now to bring good news to us, to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim the captives being released, prisoners being free. The time of the Lord's favor is here and God is taking on our enemies as we speak. To all who mourn and have sadness today, he has a crown of beauty and a joyous blessing, not mourning or sadness. Praise, not despair. Hear that praise. You see, God has planted you to bring him glory, for you are righteous. And the other word that we got was during worship today. I said, as the music was going, the drum gave me a picture of an angel's armies coming down from heavens with drums. I feel like the army is bringing the kingdom that we are speaking over this year. Heaven hears us. God hears us. He hears our hearts, and he's agreeing with what, he is, with what we are doing. The kingdom of God is here and is now, uh, and we are seeing it in incredible ways, and that's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, so amazing morning so far. I could probably just pray and close, and we would be good to go. Um, that, I mean, if you, if, like how Mari had said as she closed out worship, if you were here and you're doubting if God was real, if he was moving, I hope, hopefully now you know that he is alive and he is active and he is here and he's doing the business of his kingdom and he's wanting to change our lives. Uh, today we're gonna be in Acts 8 and we're gonna continue in this, this series as we're going through the book of Acts together. Um, and, but before we get into the text, I wanna in a way celebrate what happened last week and, and react to Max's message. If you were here last week, Max's sermon on Stephen was incredible. Uh, it was so good. Um, but it wasn't even just incredible because Max delivered it really well, but it's incredible because of the person that he was preaching about. I did Max's homework. If you were here last week, Max gave us homework to go and read Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. And so I went home and I read it. And it was interesting as I read this text, which really came down to being the last words of Stephen's life, because after that he was stoned to death for his faith in Jesus. I was just thinking, man, I want to have a life like that. I want to live my life out the way that Stephen lived out his life. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not there yet. I'm not. And what's been cool is I know that God is growing me. I know that where I'm at today in my faith is the best I've ever been. And yet I still know that I respond to the gospel in the wrong way many times in my life. And so today as we get into Acts 8, we're going to look at these four characters and see how they responded to the gospel. They've heard the good news of Jesus. They've seen the miracles like we've seen today. And then they've, they've responded I'll give you a little foreshadowing here. Not all of them are great responses, all right? And you'll be able to tell which ones are good and which ones aren't so good. So Stephen has preached his message. It uh, says that those who stoned him to death actually laid their coats down at the feet of a guy named Saul from Tarsus. He was a Pharisee, a leader in the, in the Jewish church. And uh, Saul approved of the arrest and the murder of Stephen. And so that's one of the last things we see before we get into chapter 8. And this is what it says, and this is how the murder of Stephen actually led to the expansion of the gospel in the world. It says, on that day, so literally the day that Stephen was martyred, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy, other translations say he ravaged the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So the first character we're looking at here today is Paul the persecutor. 
And by that I mean Saul the persecutor, because here's a little spoiler alert. Next week, you're gonna see Saul's life transformed by Jesus. And it becomes Paul, who you may have heard of. He's written a majority of the New Testament, right? And so Saul, though, before he got to that point, before Jesus transformed his life, what was his response to the gospel? Remember, he's already heard about Jesus. He's already seen the miracles happen. The Sanhedrin was trying to quiet them, remember? And how did he respond? Well, he responded with anger. He responded with hatred. He responded with cruelty. Now, there's a little bit of justification for Saul the persecutor, but that justification is only in reaction to missing the truth. See, if you look through uh, Paul's writings in the New Testament, if you look through the rest of the story of Acts, you see that this Saul, who became Paul, was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He came from a line of religious leaders called Pharisees. He was a Pharisee himself. He was a Roman citizen. He was educated by Gamaliel, who we talked a couple weeks ago, an incredible Roman or incredible Jewish official in the Sanhedrin. He was a man measured by the law of Moses. And in his words to the Philippians, Paul said he was blameless in his life as a Jew. He was one of the promising young Pharisees in Jerusalem and well on his way to becoming a great leader in the Jewish faith. So while he looked cruel as he ravaged or destroyed the church, his reference point is that of a follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a man who has seen what worshiping other gods looks like for the Israelites and how God responded to that. And so for him to destroy this, this rebel group that they called The Way, which we now call Christianity, I'm like, The Way's a great name. I'm kind of like... That would have been fun, just like, oh yeah, we're part of the way, right? But he's like, I have to, we have to get rid of these people because we don't want the wrath of God to come down on the Israelites. But little did he know he was missing the truth. The same thing as, as so many other religious leaders, they were missing it. Paul wrote to uh, the church in Galatia, remembering this part of his life, and he said, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish relig religion, how I violently persecuted God's church, I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. And yet, it was the traditions of his ancestors that led him and so many other religious leaders to missing the truth of Jesus. Being the Messiah that had been promised through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Being the deliverer and the savior that was prophesied by Moses and Isaiah and the other prophets. It was all written out for them. But because of their zeal for tradition, they missed it. They were blinded to the truth of Jesus. So he responds with hatred and anger and disdain and violence, ravaging the church. Do any of you know anybody who hates the church? Anyone who, who has disdain for the gospel message of Jesus? They're the hardest people to talk about Jesus with, right? Right? They're the hardest ones to share our faith with, just like Saul was, just like the religious leaders were, because they already had it made up in their mind. And this is ridiculous. Now we know the truth, but they weren't ready to listen. The second character is a lot different than Saul of Tarsus. The next, next it says, those who had been scattered, and so because of the level of persecution and, and the murder of Stephen, those who scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For, the sh for with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in, this, in the city. So the second character we're looking at here is Philip. Philip the preacher. Now, if you look back at the story of Stephen, you also would see Philip, that he was one of the seven leaders that were chosen to help support the apostles in leading the church. So what was Philip's response to the gospel? It was similar to, to Stephen's. His response was obedience to the call, obedience to the mission. Acts 1.8, which is, in my opinion, kind of the theme verse of the entirety of the book of Acts, says that you will, be, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Stephen's death, it started this process, the spread of the gospel outside of Jerusalem. Up until this point, they were only preaching the good news of Jesus in Jerusalem. But then they went out. 
Acts 11, 19 says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. And then Philip went to this, a city in Samaria. Now, Samaritans were an impure race in the eyes of the Jews. They were a mixed race. They were Jews who married Gentiles and had babies. And so in the eyes of these Jews, these were these, these half-blooded, mixed-race Samaritans were lesser than. They were hated among the Jews. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, it's straight racism that the Jews felt towards the Samaritans. And yet in the kingdom of God, we know that the heart of Jesus is for all people groups of the whole world to be unified under the cause of Christ, to be one under Christ. We saw in John 4 when Jesus had his interaction with a Samaritan woman where she was so surprised that this Jewish man would actually come and talk to her and ask for, her, ask for a cup of water from her. She said, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. But Jesus showed her what her identity was what her identity was in the kingdom of God. He continues to do that throughout history to the outsiders, to the downtrodden. He did that to, to those who were in slavery. He's done that for, for women. He's done that for children. God's kingdom is for all who believe. And that was the mission of the early church. That was the commission, the great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That word nations it could actually better be translated as all peoples. Go make disciples of all peoples. And that is what Philip was doing, making disciples of the Samaritans. But see, he wasn't just preaching the good news of Jesus to the Samaritans, but he was also demonstrating God's power by performing miracles, just like Stephen, just like the apostles that we've already read about so far in this series. And people were moved by the power. They were swayed by the message, and they were saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 8, there was great joy in the city. The people of Samaria, the enemies of the Jews, heard the good news of Jesus and believed. And they were delivered from physical affliction. They were delivered from demonic control. They were delivered, most importantly, from their sin. And so no wonder there was great joy. But what is so cool about Philip's work with the Samaritans is that God, in his grace, had built a bridge between two estranged people groups and made all the believers one in Christ. And he is still building bridges today, and he has built bridges over the course of our history. Because whether we are Jews or Samaritans, black or white, Latino or native, South Asian or South African, we are all one in Christ. We are all one in Christ because of Christ. So we, as believers, should be building bridges just like Philip was building bridges among different people groups, into, into different cultures, into ancient prejudices, all for the sake of Christ and the unity that we can have under him. It's our mission. It's our call. Make disciples of all nations, of all peoples. So what was Philip's response to the gospel? It was obedience. To be his witness, to live out the call, to make disciples of all people, to be on mission, on March 26th, uh, I'm, doing, I'm helping host a future missionaries gathering in Marysville. I get to lead up recruitment for the Northwest District of Foursquare when it comes to future missionaries. I've already talked to some of you about joining me on that trip. And if you're in this room and you feel like God is maybe calling you to live out your faith like Philip and to cross cultural lines for the sake of the gospel, I want you to join me. So after service, just come and talk to me. We'll connect and you can come with us, okay? That's a side note. We'll get back to the story. How many of us want to be like Philip, though, right? Just living that call out in our lives. I do. But I think that the reality is, is that for much of us, we get tempted by the next character in this story. In verse 9, it says, Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and was amazed and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. He was very full of himself. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. I kind of think of like the Barnum Bailey like circus things. It's like, oh, Simon the sorcerer, the great power of God. I was like, yeah, I could see why people would be like, this is amazing. He was this magician. 
It says, they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and the miracles he saw. So the third character we're looking at here is Simon the sorcerer. See, Simon was a magician. It was likely probably like sleight of hand or like illusionist type of, of magic, but everyone was so enthralled by what he was doing. But now, even he was seeing something better than he had ever experienced. So he believed. He wanted to follow. He wanted to learn more. He wanted to, to see how he could have this type of power. It says, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because they, uh, the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It says, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, if you remember from Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit first fell on the apostles, it was a pretty incredible sight. They started speaking in tongues. There were these flames of fire above their heads. It was this incredible thing. Now, we don't get to see exactly what happened as they laid hands and prayed for these Samaritans, but whatever it was, it made Simon the sorcerer pretty excited. Because it says, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. You're like, ah, there's Simon the sorcerer again. There's his true self, his true character coming out because he was seeking after this power for his own reasons. What was Simon's response to the gospel? This is the greatest show. <laughs> right? Like he was just like amazed by it. And it in Simon's story, who was the gospel for? It was for him. And yet so often we look at salvation as this thing like, what can, what can he do for me? If I'm gonna give my life to him, what can he do for me? How can I be successful if I have faith in Jesus? How can I maybe get some extra blessings, right? Or obtain the power because of the faith. What were the miracles about? What were the signs about? What were, who, what were the apostles like? How did they react every time that they laid hands on someone and prayed and they were healed? Were they like, oh yeah, that's right. Bring in the glory. I'm the best. Here I am. No, they're like, stop looking at me. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. The glory is all for him. But Simon wanted the glory. Simon wanted that for himself. He wanted what he always wanted. He wanted the praise he wanted the power. Well, he didn't get it. it. Says Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy this gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. And, Pe and Simon responded saying, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. See, I think some of us need to repent. And I think you can look at this even, even a little bit differently than Simon and recognize that this is somebody who had the faith. He started to believe, right? But it didn't actually transform anything inside of him. It was a dead faith where he said he was a follower of the way. And yet, God was not transforming his life because his heart was in the wrong place. Maybe you might relate to that. It says, afterward, uh, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, stopping in all the Samaritan villages on the way to preach the gospel. If you remember anything from Peter and John, they never miss an opportunity to teach the gospel. That's a great thing about them. Um, but I think if you look a little bit like Simon, you might want to check in this next story and see if this might be more of where you need to be. Because what happened next, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet, and the spirit told Philip, Go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. 
and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the, and the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And so the fourth character we're looking at here is the Ethiopian, the seeking Ethiopian. Now, before we continue in the story, I want to point out something about this story because how did Philip end up with the Ethiopian in his chariot? God led him there. God told him to go there. This story should encourage us in our own personal journey of witnessing for Jesus. And maybe we won't have an angel of the Lord saying, go to this person, but we do have the Holy Spirit that is leading us and guiding us. And that there's no such thing as coincidences in the kingdom of God. And that he's leading us to be ready because he's gonna put us in the right place at the right time with the right people for a reason. That is for the kingdom. That is for the sake of the gospel. So Philip gets up into the carriage and it says, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from earth. This is Isaiah 53, verse seven and eight in particular for us to read. But in the, the reality of what was happening, it was Philip was coming up on him as he was reading this whole section of scripture, which is one of the most incredible prophecies of Jesus from the prophet Isaiah. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. See, these verses describe the, wit the willingness of Jesus to sacrifice himself for our sins, even to the point of death. As Philip ex explained who Jesus was and the fulfillment of, of this scripture in Isaiah, the Ethiopian began to understand the gospel as the Holy Spirit opened his mind to the truth. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. The Ethiopian moved from a place of intrigue to a place of understanding God's plan for salvation. So it goes on saying, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And in verse 37, which if you're following along in your Bibles, you might not see it there, and I'll explain that in a second, but it says, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, if you have your Bibles and you see there's not a verse 37 there, it's because that verse in the ancient manuscripts that, that we have been found of the book of Acts, they don't all contain that verse. But it doesn't mean that what was said in it is not true because if you look in the book of Romans, you can see a very similar thing where Paul wrote, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So how did the Ethiopian respond to the gospel? With faith, with surrender, with obedience, and with sacrifice. Baptism is dying to your old self and walking in a new life in Christ. So he sacrificed who he was so that his identity would only be found in Jesus. How many of you need to respond that way? to die to your old self and walk in the newness of life. See, in Acts 8, we have four responses to the gospel. You have Saul, the persecutor, who hated it. You had Philip, the preacher, who lived in its fullness. You had Simon, the sorcerer, who tried to gain from it. And you had the seeking Ethiopian who let it transform his life. Now, if you're like Saul, you probably aren't here in person and you're possibly not even watching online because you don't want to be here. But if you are, take this as a sign that Jesus wants to change your life. And come next week and see how spiteful Saul had his life transformed by Jesus. Jesus might want to knock you off your horse. And if you're like Philip, like I said earlier, and you're ready to change the world for the sake of the gospel, let's get after it. I'm ready, let's roll. Let's make it happen. And see how God could use us to build bridges for the kingdom of God. 
if you're like Simon the sorcerer, repent and check your motives. Are you living out a dead faith? Are you a Christian just for being a Christian's sake? Or is it actually transforming your life to live for him? And if you're seeking like the Ethiopian, maybe you've heard this before, you've, you've heard of who Jesus is, you're even sitting here today and you're like, what is all this stuff that's going on? Healings. People in tears because the Holy Spirit is just moving. What is this? It's the gospel message of Jesus. It's the truth that is only found in him. He gave his life for you so you could be set free and walk in the fullness of what we saw in Philip, of what we got to see in Amanda's life. Transformation. It's for you. Start your journey of being a witness of the goodness of God. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the gospel because all of these stories that we read today, everything that we've seen uh, in our time of worship, Lord, as, as we even got to experience the beautiful healing power that you put on Amanda's life, Lord, we recognize it's all because of the gospel. It's all because of you and what you did for us. And so I know that we all respond differently and have, have struggled in our response of how we act towards, towards your truth. And some of us are like the Ethiopian and we are seeking it out. We're trying to figure out what that means in our lives, but we haven't fully stepped into that, Lord. And so I pray today that if, there, if there's anyone in this room or watching online that is at that place, that they will cross over that line and step into the fullness of life that is with you. Lord, I pray for anyone in here who might be like Simon the sorcerer and be living a dead faith. Lord, that you will help them awaken to the reality of what it means to be a follower of you. To live a selfless, humble, faith-filled life. Lord, I pray for anyone in here or watching online or anyone that we love that is like Saul right now. Lord, I pray that you will bring transformation to their life and that you will knock them off their horse. Reveal yourself to them, Lord, that they can know the truth of the gospel, that they can know who you are, Jesus, in their lives. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come. We want to be like Philip. We want to see cultures and people groups all over the world be unified under the cause of Christ. Help us lead into that. If you're in this place and you find yourself either in the place of the Ethiopian where you're seeking after the good news of Jesus and you have not surrendered your life over to him yet, maybe you've heard about it, but you haven't said yes to him, today's the day to make that decision. So if you're here and you've never given your life over to Jesus and today, today you wanna to surrender to him, will you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I need to surrender myself to the Lord. I see that hand awesome. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I see that ran right here. We're with you, that's great. Okay, there's some people who need to join them because some of you are walking a dead faith right now and you're just being a Christian because that's who you are. God wants to awaken some things inside you. If you feel like you've been living just a dead faith and you want God to awaken something inside you, will you just raise your hand too and say, that's me, I need, I need to have, yeah, I see that, awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, see that hand, see that hand. See those hands. Yep, see that hand. God wants us to walk into the fullness of a life of following him. I wanna pray a prayer, and for all of us who raised our hands today, this is, this is a prayer, and really for even more, it's for all of us, that's just saying, God, I need to give my life completely over to you. I need to surrender to you. Like Paul said to the Romans, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, we are saved. And so we're gonna do that. So I want you to repeat this prayer after me so our voices actually will speak it out. Repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I surrender to you. I give you my heart. I give you my will. I want to live for you. I want to live on mission. Help me to be a light. Forgive me of my sins. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord.
and I will serve no one other. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is good.